In this lecture, we're talking about drugs used to treat arrhythmias. Now, an arrhythmia is any type of disturbance in the heart's rhythm. Technically, the term arrhythmia needs, means no rhythm, so maybe a better term for these disorders would be dysrhythmias, but we call them arrhythmias. We can be talking about tachycardia or tachyarrhythmias where the heart is going too fast or bradyarrhythmias where the heart is going too slow. We can talk about regular arrhythmias where there's an extra beat or an early beat in a regular fashion or irregular arrhythmias where those extra beats are unpredictable. A lot of arrhythmias are completely asymptomatic, uh, but uh, some arrhythmias are symptomatic. Patients will feel palpitations. They'll feel their heart thumping in their chest or racing or skipping. Arrhythmias really become a problem when they decrease cardiac output. Arrhythmias frequently occur secondary to other medical conditions, most notably myocardial infarction. More than 80% of patients with an MI will have some type of arrhythmia, and arrhythmias are a leading cause of mortality for MIs. Arrhythmias can also be caused by thyroid dysfunction and also various electrolyte abnormalities. Now we're going to talk about different classes of antiarrhythmic drugs, and we'll review some basic electrophysiology, and that'll make this all very straightforward. But the four classes of antiarrhythmic drugs we'll talk about are the class 1 drugs, which are sodium channel blockers, class 2 drugs, which are beta blockers, class 3 antiarrhythmics are potassium channel blockers, and class 4 antiarrhythmics are the calcium channel blockers. And we'll also talk about a couple of other drugs which aren't classified using that system, most notably digoxin and adenosine. And there's a mnemonic that can help you remember which channels are being blocked by which class of drugs. The mnemonic is, no bad boy keeps clean. N for no is for sodium. Bad boy, BB, is for beta blockers. Keeps, K, for potassium. And clean, C, for calcium channel blockers. Let's talk a little bit about cardiac electrophysiology. So we need to talk about the resting potential of myocardial cells. The resting potential is determined by the concentrations of sodium and potassium and calcium and chloride in and outside of the cell. The cardiac cell membranes are generally pretty permeable to potassium, which is much higher concentration inside the cell than outside. And so the resting potential of the cell is determined primarily by the potassium concentration. And that resting potential, based entirely on potassium, is about minus 75 millivolts. Some textbooks say it's minus 80 or minus 85, but about minus 75 or minus 80. The exact number is not important, but it's in that, that ballpark. Now, if the cell membrane was freely permeable to sodium and just sodium, the resting potential would be much higher because there's more sodium outside the cell than inside the cell, and that resting potential would be about positive 55 millivolts. And if the membrane uh, was freely permeable to calcium alone, the potential would be about positive 20 millivolts, so higher than it is with potassium, but lower than it would be with uh, sodium. These channels are voltage gated, which means they open at preset voltages. And there are three states, resting, open, and inactive. And it's conformational changes in the channel that allow these three states to exist. In the open state, ions can move through freely down their concentration gradient, and this is usually a very transient process. In the inactive state, the ion channel is closed, so there's no ion movement, but the channel is not responsive to voltage changes. And in the resting state, the channel is closed, but it's responsive to voltage. It's ready to be opened. This will be important when we talk about how the various drugs work. So now let's talk about the myocyte action potential, or the ventricular action potential. At rest, the resting potential is determined by potassium, about negative 75 millivolts. During phase zero depolarization, voltage-gated sodium channels open. Sodium transiently floods the cell, and the membrane potential rapidly rises, approaching positive 55 millivolts. Phase one is initial repolarization. The sodium channels are inactivated, and potassium channels begin to open. The membrane potential starts to repolarize rapidly. In phase two, the voltage-gated slow calcium channels open. This would depolarize the membrane potential to positive 20 millivolts, except the potassium channels are also open. So that's repolarizing the membrane. The two currents balance each other, and there's a plateau for about 100 milliseconds. In phase three, the slow potassium channels are fully open, and the calcium channels are inactivated. Potassium flows out of the cell, and the potential returns to the resting potential of negative 75 millivolts. Between phase zero and the end of phase three, the cell cannot be stimulated to depolarize again. It has to wait until the resting potential is reset 
and the channels are all in their resting states. This is called the effective refractory period. During phase four, sodium-potassium ATPase and the sodium-calcium exchanger are restoring the normal intracellular concentrations of all these ions, and the cell is ready for the next stimulus. So all that applies to the muscle cells, the myocytes, and also the conduction tissue, such as the bundle of Hiss and the Purkinje fibers. But what about the pacemaker cells? The heart contains specialized cells that exhibit automaticity. That is, they can intrinsically generate rhythmic action potentials in the absence of external stimuli. This applies to primarily the SA node and the AV node. I want you to note the differences in the action potential in the pacemaker tissue. At rest, phase four, the resting potential is around negative 75 millivolts, but it doesn't stay there. There's a gradual increase in sodium conductance, which causes a slow diastolic depolarization. Eventually, the potential reaches some threshold, which opens voltage-gated calcium channels. As calcium enters the cell, the cell depolarizes. These pacemaker cells don't have rapid voltage-gated sodium channels, so the depolarization occurs a little more slowly and a little less steeply. This results in slow conduction velocity. In the AV node, this prolongs conduction from the atria to the ventricles. There's no plateau in phase two, and in phase three, the calcium channels are inactivated and potassium channels open, which repolarizes the membrane. So let's talk about some different arrhythmias and what causes arrhythmias. Most arrhythmias arise either from abnormal automaticity or from a defect in impulse conduction. So talking about abnormal automaticity, the SA node fires faster than other cells that exhibit automaticity, and so it sets the pace. It's the pacemaker. And the other cells are depolarized by the SA node's impulse, so they don't have a chance to generate their own action potentials. But if there's damage to those myocardial cells from hypoxia or from uh, potassium imbalance, those other cells can become more excitable, and they can generate faster action potentials and faster paces than the SA node. And in that case, the, uh, the cells may remain partially depolarized, and they can reach their fi firing threshold earlier than the normal cells would. So a lot of drugs um, will suppress automaticity by blocking the sodium channels or blocking calcium channels to reduce the ratio of these ions to potassium. And this decreases the slope of the phase four diastolic depolarization in that automatic tissue, in the pacemaker tissue. Or it can raise the threshold uh, of discharge to a less negative voltage. So it's harder for the cells to reach that threshold and cause depolarization. And this prolongs the effective refractory period, and it slows the heart rate. Another type of arrhythmia can be caused by abnormalities in impulse conduction. If there's myocardial injury, such as a scar, scar tissue that develops after an MI, for instance, you can have a unidirectional block in the conduction pathway so that the conductive signal can re-enter that uh, blocked tissue retrograde, like through the back door, and cause an extra beat or an irregular rhythm. If the injury causes cells in a certain area to have a prolonged refractory period, you can have an abnormal conduction pathway. And this re-entry is a very common cause of arrhythmias, and it can occur at any level of the cardiac conduction system. Various drugs that affect conduction abnormalities will prevent re-entry by slowing conduction or by increasing the refractory period of the non-injured cells so that you convert that unidirectional block to a bidirectional block. So that's enough background. Let's start talking about some individual drugs that are used to treat arrhythmia. But first, I want to give you one quick word of caution. There are a lot of drugs out there that can affect the heart rhythm, but very few of them are actually proven to be beneficial. A few of those to, to mention are lidocaine, which is proven to be very beneficial in acutely terminating ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC. And then also adenosine and verapamil are, are proven to treat supraventricular tachycardia, or SVT. But a lot of the other drugs we're going to talk about have never been proven to be beneficial in, in long-term studies. And a lot of these drugs, although they're used to treat arrhythmias, actually have what we call pro-arrhythmic effects. They can actually cause arrhythmias. So it's, it's potentially dangerous to use some of these drugs. You need to be very cautious and very careful when using them. Now remember, we talked about four different classes of drugs, class one, two, three, and four. Remember the mnemonic, no bad boy keeps clean. But many of these drugs don't fit neatly into one class or another. They have overlapping effects, as we'll see. They can affect multiple ion channels. So starting with the class one antiarrhythmic drugs, remember that mnemonic, no bad boy keeps clean. The N is for no, 
That's for sodium. So these are sodium channel blockers. These drugs act by blocking voltage-gated sodium channels. They, they act very much like local anesthetics, like lidocaine. Um, the, the blockage of these sodium channels causes a decreased slope of phase zero in the action potential, and they generally cause a decreased excitability and decreased conduction velocity in the tissue. These drugs bind more rapidly to open sodium channels or inactive sodium channels, but not resting sodium channels. So they're going to mainly affect tissue that are frequently depolarizing. So that's, that's very useful. That's called use dependence or state dependence. And that means these drugs are going to act on parts of the heart that are firing more rapidly, parts of the heart that are generating um, more arrhythmia. And, and the, the normal parts of the heart are not going to be as affected by the sodium channel blockers. Now, in general, use of sodium channel blockers is declining because they are potentially proarrhythmic and there are safer drugs in other classes. They're potentially proarrhythmic, especially in patients who have reduced ventricular function or patients with ischemic heart disease. We already said that a lot of these patients with arrhythmias have had ischemic heart disease, they've had MIs, so giving drugs that are potentially dangerous to those patients uh, is really dangerous stuff. So the class one antiarrhythmics are subdivided into three groups according to their effects on the duration of the action potential. They can also be differentiated by the speed of dissociation from the sodium channel. Class 1A drugs decrease the slope of phase zero, but they also have some class three activity, which means they block potassium channels. And this prolongs the action potential and prolongs the refractory period. Overall, conduction is slowed and the QRS is widened. Class 1A drugs have an intermediate speed of dissociation from sodium channels. These drugs are not very commonly used anymore. Class 1B drugs shorten the action potential by shortening phase 3 repolarization. They have little effect on the rate of depolarization. And they rapidly dissociate from sodium channels. 1B drugs are some of the most commonly used class 1 drugs. They preferentially affect ischemic tissue or depolarized tissue, and they're useful for treating ventricular tachyarrhythmias, especially following an MI, and they're also useful for treating digitalis-induced arrhythmias. Class 1C drugs have no effect at all on the duration of the action potential or the refractory period. They slow conduction by slowing phase 0 depolarization, and they're slow to dissociate from sodium channels. Now, the class 1C drugs are not frequently used. They're a uh, Proarrhythmic potential is very pronounced. They're used as a last resort for patients with refractory ventricular tachycardia or intractable supraventricular tachycardia. And they're generally contraindicated following an MI because of their proarrhythmic qualities. So you can remember 1C, C is for contraindicated following an MI, and 1B, B is for best following an MI. So how do you remember which of these drugs fall into which class, class 1A, 1B, and 1C? Well, there are a couple of mnemonics worth, worth mentioning. The first one is, police department questioned the little man for pushing ecstasy. So look at these as three sets of three drugs. The first three are the 1A drugs, police department questioned. That stands for procainamide, disopyramide, and quinidine. The second three are the 1B drugs. The little man stands for tokenide, lidocaine, and mexilatine. And the last three drugs are the 1C drugs for pushing ecstasy, flecainide, propafenone, and enconide. Now, enconide is not going to be used very much because it's very proarrhythmic, but it fits into the mnemonic. Another mnemonic we use is double quarter pounder, lettuce, tomato, mayo, fries, please. There's one more thing to mention before we look at individual class 1 drugs, and that is the issue of QT prolongation. There are several class 1 antiarrhythmics that have class 3 activity, as I've mentioned. And that means they inhibit potassium channels and they prolong the QT interval on the EKG. The prolonged QT interval leads to an increased risk of various ventricular tachycardias called torsade de pointe. This is a potentially life-threatening arrhythmia where you have a, an alternating uh, amplitude of the tachycardic waves, the VTAC waves, so there'll be a small amplitude, then a large amplitude, and it looks like you've taken a ribbon of crepe paper and kind of twisted it, and torsade de pointe means twisting around the points. Most QT prolongation is induced by various drugs. It's a little daunting to look at this list, but let me break it down this way for you. First, you have erythromycin and chlorithromycin. Those are both macrolide antibiotics. Pentamidine is another antibiotic. Moxifloxacin and levofloxacin are both quinolone antibiotics. You've got imipramine, desipramine, and amitriptyline, which are all tricyclic antidepressants. 
got doxepin, which is used for um, anxiety. And then you've got a large list of antipsychotics. Thioridazine, mesoridazine, haloperidol, risperidone, ziprazidone, and quetiapine. So you have to kind of be aware of these drugs and the fact that they may prolong the QT interval. And you want to be especially careful if you're using more than one drug that can prolong the QT interval. You know, if you use two or three drugs, you're really going to prolong the QT interval and you may really increase the risk of torsade. And anytime you're going to um, put a patient on uh, an antiarrhythmic, you need to look at the other drugs that they're taking and see if they're taking anything that's going to prolong the QT interval further. You should also be aware that azole antifungal drugs, including fluconazole and itraconazole, can inhibit drug metabolism and they can increase the drug levels of, of a lot of different drugs, especially some of these drugs, and that can further prolong the QT interval. So be aware of that. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. Hello! Don't mind that. That's my new neighbor, Cal. He's fixing up his old motorcycle. You know, I used to date bad boys like that. The sound of it still gets my heart a flutter. <laughs> anyway, stay focused. Um, where was I? Oh, what are the classes of antiarrhythmics? Class 1, sodium channel blockers. Class 2, beta blockers. Class 3, potassium channel blockers. And class 4, calcium channel blo blockers. <laughs> well, no bad boy keeps clean. <laughs> no, they don't, do they? I mean, I mean I'm just going to go say hello. <laughs> We're neighbors anyway. Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Lewis, one of the chief educators here at Doctors in Training. It's time for your quick review number one. Let's get started. How is cardiac muscle contraction different from skeletal muscle contraction? Well, in cardiac muscle, the action potential has a plateau, and this is due to calcium influx. Now, the cardiac nodal cells spontaneously uh, depolarize, and then cardiac myocytes are electrically coupled to each other by gap junctions. Next question. What physiology accounts for the automaticity of the AV and SA nodes? So what keeps our heart pumping? It's the phase four gradual sodium conductance. So the membrane becomes more and more uh, permeable to sodium. And as uh, those ions come in, then you get closer and closer to an action potential. Next question. What are the primary mechanisms of action of the different classes of antiarrhythmic? So you should know these by now. Uh, class 1, sodium channel blockers, class 2, beta blockers, class 3, potassium channel blockers, and class 4, uh, calcium channel blockers. We'll probably go over that again later, too. Next question. What are some therapeutic uses for class 1B antiarrhythmic drugs? Uh, so first, we have acute ventricular tachyarrhythmias. So especially remember post-MI, so the class 1B are best for post-MI and then digitalis-induced arrhythmias as well, good for 1B. Next question. Prolonged QT intervals can increase the risk of torsades to point. What is torsades? So uh, we gave you the illustration of taking some paper or strips of paper and just kind of twisting it because literally it means twisting of the points. Uh, so you see this ventricular tachycardia that is characterized by shifting of the sinusoidal uh, waveforms on the EKG. And this can ultimately progress to ventricular fibrillation, and that's why we don't like it. Next question. A 62-year-old male is recovering from a myocardial infarction. If he developed an arrhythmia, which subclass uh, 1 antiarrhythmic would you want to avoid? So we went over this during the lecture. Remember, it's the class 1C, or contraindicated post-MI. And what did we just talk about before, which is a good one to use? The class 1B. So 1B, better choice. Class C, contraindicated. Next question. A 33-year-old female who is taking an antibiotic for a UTI presents with a flutter in her chest. Her EKG shows torsades to point. Which antibiotic is she likely taking that could prolong her QT interval and predispose her to this condition? Uh, so we went through a list of drugs. She's on uh, uh, an antibiotic for a UTI, a common one that we use are the fluoroquinolones, and more specifically, Leviquin. So she might be taking that medication, which might prolong her QT interval and, and lead to this problem. 
Let's very, very quickly go over the other medications. What other antibiotics? Remember the macrolide antibiotics. We don't generally use those for UTIs. Pentamidine, tricyclic antidepressants, doxepin, uh, antipsychotics as well, the whole list of anti antipsychotics. So remember those medications. They prolong that QT interval. All right, so that's going to conclude our quick review number one. Let's get back to the lecture. So now we're finally ready to talk about some specific class one drugs. You probably want to pay more attention to the adverse effects of these drugs than you do when to use them because it's, it's a little bit of an art rather than a pure science about when you're going to use these various drugs. So kind of focus on the big picture, pay attention to the adverse effect profile because that is something you're likely to be tested on. So the first class 1A drug to talk about is quinidine. This is sort of the prototype class 1A drug. It's a sodium channel blocker, so it's going to bind to the sodium channels and prevent sodium from coming into the cell, and then it's, that way it's going to slow the rapid upstroke of phase zero depolarization. That's primarily what it does in the myocyte. In, uh, in the pacemaker cells, it's going to decrease the slope of the phase four spontaneous depolarization. Remember, that was caused by an increasing sodium conductance. So in the pacemaker cells, it's going to slow that down a little bit. And quinidine also inhibits potassium channels, so it has some class three activity. Now, quinidine is not used much anymore. Calcium channel blockers are becoming more widely used uh, because quinidine has a lot of toxicity, which we'll mention briefly. Um, quinidine has historically been used for a wide variety of arrhythmias, including atrial arrhythmias, AV junctional arrhythmias, ventricular tachyarrhythmias. It's also been used to maintain sinus rhythm after cardioversion of atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation. That's where you put the uh, the electrodes on the patient's chest and you shock the heart back into a normal rhythm and then you put them on quinidine to preserve that normal rhythm and prevent them from going back into their atrial fibrillation. And sometimes quinidine has been used to prevent ventricular tachycardia. In terms of pharmacokinetics, quinidine is rapidly absorbed after oral administration and it's extensively metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes and it, it, that forms active metabolites. Now remember, there was a, a mnemonic device used to help you remember which drugs are inducers of cytochrome P450. That mnemonic is BCGPQRS, which stands for barbiturates, carbamazepine, griseofulvin, phenytoin, quinidine, there it is, rifampin, and St. John's wort. So let's talk about the adverse effects from quinidine. In terms of arrhythmia, as I said, a lot of these drugs have pro-arrhythmic effects. So quinidine will prolong the QT interval, and it may predispose to torsades. Quinidine can also cause SA node and AV node block, and it sometimes can cause asystole. At toxic levels, the drug may actually induce ventricular tachycardia. And all of these effects can be exacerbated by hyperkalemia, or high potassium levels. In terms of other adverse effects we see from quinidine, you get a lot of GI side effects. You get nausea and vomiting and sometimes diarrhea. You get a condition called cinchonism. Uh, cinchona bark, the bark of the cinchona tree, is where we derive drugs like quinine and quinidine. And so these, uh, these drugs can cause something called cinchonism if you have toxic levels. Uh, cinchonism is characterized by blurred vision, tinnitus, or ringing in the ears, and it is pronounced tinnitus, not tinnitus, and then also headache, and then sometimes disorientation and psychosis. The structure of quinidine is somewhat similar to aspirin, and you can remember that aspirin sometimes causes similar side effects of tinnitus, sometimes headache. Quinidine has mild alpha-blocking actions. It also has some atropine-like effects. Quinidine also can cause thrombocytopenia. That's important for you to remember. And quinidine will interact with another antiarrhythmic called digoxin. That's a drug that's also used for heart failure. Quinidine uh, decreases the renal clearance of digoxin and therefore it increases the risk of digoxin toxicity. Quinidine has, also has a minor effect of displacing digoxin from its tissue binding sites, so you can increase digoxin levels that way as well. The next class 1A drug is called procainamide, and it's very similar to quinidine in the way it works. Its primary use is for a condition called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, or WPW syndrome. Uh, basically, procainamide increases the refractory period of an accessory pathway, which is involved with WPW. And so if you increase the refractory period, you make it less likely for that accessory pathway to be active. Um, for the pharmacokinetics, procainamide is well absorbed following oral administration, just like quinidine was. It has a relatively short half-life of only maybe two to three hours. 
Part of the drug is acetylated in the liver to N-acetylprocainamide, or NAPA, N-A-P-A. And NAPA has some class three properties. NAPA is eliminated renally, and so you have to adjust the dose of procainamide in renal failure. There are several adverse effects for procainamide worth knowing. Number one, I want you to know it can cause a reversible lupus-like syndrome in 25 to 30 percent of patients who are on procainamide long term. So there are five drugs that cause a lupus-like syndrome. The mnemonic we had was SHIP, S-H-I-P-P, which stands for sulfasalazine, hydralazine, isoniazid, phenytoin, and procainamide. Other adverse effects, toxic concentrations of procainamide can cause asystole and can also cause ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, procainamide can cause some CNS effects, including depression and hallucination and psychosis. Generally, though, procainamide has fewer GI side effects compared to quinidine. The last class 1A drug to talk about is called disopyramide. It, has, uh, it is similar to quinidine in the way it works. It has more negative inotropic effects than either quinidine or procainamide, so it's going to reduce myocardial contractility. It may be dangerous in patients who have heart failure. Pro uh, disopyramide, rather, will also cause some peripheral vasoconstriction, and it also has class 3 activity, so it will prolong the QT interval. Disopyramide is sometimes used in the treatment of ventricular arrhythmias as an alternative to procainamide or quinidine. About 50% of the drug is excreted unchanged by the kidneys, and about 30% of the drug is hepatically eliminated. In terms of adverse effects, the main one you need to know about for disopyramide is it has anticholinergic effects, so it will cause dry mouth, urinary retention, blurred vision, constipation, and all those other nasty, unpleasant anticholinergic effects. Then moving on to the 1B drugs, the class 1B antiarrhythmics. First one is lidocaine. As we mentioned, it rapidly associates and dissociates from sodium channels, and it affects um, the cardiac cells that are depolarized and firing rapidly. It will shorten phase three repolarization, uh, and it will decrease the duration of the action potential, as all 1B drugs will. Lidocaine, as I mentioned, is definitely useful in the treatment of ventricular tachyarrhythmias following MI. Remember, we said that 1B drugs are best for post-MI patients. Lidocaine does not slow cardiac conduction, and it has very little effect on atrial or AV junctional arrhythmias. So it's really just used for ventricular arrhythmias. And as you know, lidocaine can also be used as a local anesthetic. Lidocaine is extensively metabolized by the liver using first-pass hepatic metabolism, and so you cannot give it orally. It's only given IV. It's eliminated almost entirely by the liver, and so you have to adjust the dose in patients who have liver disease. Now, in terms of adverse effects, lidocaine is relatively safe. It has a very wide toxic to therapeutic ratio. It can have some proarrhythmic effects. It has no negative inotropic effect, and it can cause some CNS effects, including drowsiness, slurred speech, paresthesias, agitation, confusion, and uh, convulsions. The other two, class 1B antiarrhythmics, tokenide and mexilatine, both have actions that are similar to lidocaine, but they can be given orally, unlike lidocaine. So these are typically given to prevent ventricular arrhythmias following an MI, especially mexilatine. Uh, tokenide is also used for this indication. In terms of adverse effects, tokenide can cause some pulmonary toxicity and may lead to pulmonary fibrosis, so that's worth remembering. Let's move on then to the class 1C drugs. We'll start with flecainide. Flecainide, like all 1C drugs, slowly dissociates from the sodium channels. Uh, it shows prominent effects on the heart even at normal heart rates. Flecainide delays or slows phase zero upstroke, and it causes marked slowing of conduction at all cardiac tissue. It has minimal effect on the duration of the action potential and minimal effect on the duration of the refractory period. And automaticity is reduced by increasing the threshold rather than slowing the slow uh, phase four depolarization. Flecainide does have some negative inotropic effects and it can aggravate congestive heart failure. And as we said, the 1C drugs are contraindicated following MI. Obviously, you don't want to give a patient who's had you know, stunned myocardium uh, a, a drug that's going to reduce myocardial contractility. In terms of therapeutic uses, flecainide is used to treat refractory ventricular arrhythmias only. It's sometimes used to suppress 
premature ventricular contraction. But really, we're talking about uh, a ventricular tachyarrhythmia that's not responsive to any other treatment. You're going to use flecainide kind of as a last resort. Flecainide is absorbed orally, and it undergoes minimal biotransformation. It has a long half-life of 16 to 20 hours. Flecainide can cause some dizziness and blurred vision, also headaches and nausea, and it can aggravate pre-existing arrhythmias, and it can induce ventricular tachycardia that's resistant to treatment. So you had a patient who had ventricular tachycardia. They weren't responding to anything else. You give them flecainide, you can actually cause ventricular tachycardia that's not responsive to anything else. So you can see why this drug is not widely used anymore. The other 1C drug worth mentioning is called propafenone. Propafenone is very similar to flecainide. It slows conduction in all cardiac tissue, and it's considered to be a broad-spectrum antiarrhythmic agent, but again, not a first-line drug. It's really only used for arrhythmias that are not responsive to any other treatment. Next, we'll talk about the class two antiarrhythmic drugs, and these are the beta blockers. Remember, no bad boy keeps clean. Bad boy BB for beta blocker. Beta blockers slow or flatten phase four depolarization in pacemaker tissue. So it's going to suppress abnormal pacemakers. It's going to prolong conduction through the AV node. It's going to decrease the heart rate, and it's going to decrease contractility. So these are primarily used for tachyarrhythmias, such as VTAC and SVT, that are caused by sympathetic activity that's increased. It's sometimes used for atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation and AV nodal reentry tachycardia, which is called AVNRT. That's where you have a reentrant pathway that goes through the AV node and causes a reentry tachycardia. Unlike the class 1 drugs, beta blockers and class 3 drugs are increasing in use. So we're using less and less class 1 drugs and more and more. Uh, class 2 and 3 drugs. Beta blockers are generally discussed in the lecture on adrenergic antagonists and also the lecture on heart failure and the lecture on hypertension. So there are a lot of uses for these drugs outside of arrhythmias. But I'll just briefly go over the points dealing with beta blockers and their uses as antiarrhythmic drugs. The first drug to talk about, propranolol, uh, will reduce the incidence of sudden arrhythmic death, uh, usually ventricular arrhythmias following an MI, but it has a lot of adverse effects. It can cause hypotension and bradycardia, obviously. In addition to blocking the beta receptors, the beta-1 receptors in the heart, it also blocks beta-2 receptors in the lungs, in the uh, trachea, and the bronchioles, and that can cause bronchospasm. Beta blockers typically cause some fatigue. They can cause some erectile dysfunction. They can cause hypoglycemia, and they can also mask the sympathetically uh, moderated uh, effects of hypoglycemia, the symptoms of hypoglycemia, so patients may not realize they're becoming hypoglycemic. And beta blockers can also cause some dyslipidemia. They can lower HDL and they can raise triglycerides. So a lot of the side effects that we worry about with, with uh, propranolol are also seen in other beta blockers, such as metoprolol. But metoprolol has one benefit over propranolol, it is cardioselective, meaning it only blockades the beta-1 receptor, not the beta-2 receptor. So you're not going to get any bronchospasm with a, a cardioselective beta blocker like metoprolol. You can still get the other side effects, the hypotension, the bradycardia, fatigue, erectile dysfunction, and the metabolic effect. Another cardioselective beta blocker that's sometimes used is esmolol. It's very short-acting. It's really only given as an IV drug if you have a, an acute arrhythmia during surgery or in an emergency situation. And another cardioselective beta blocker is acibutilol, which is sometimes used for ventricular arrhythmias. But the most common uh, beta blocker used for arrhythmias is metoprolol. The next class of drugs are the class 3 drugs. The class 3 antiarrhythmics are the potassium channel blockers. Remember, no bad boy keeps clean. K for keep, K for potassium channel blockers. So these drugs block potassium channels. They diminish the outward potassium current during repolarization, so it takes longer to repolarize the cell membrane. Therefore, they prolong the action potential without affecting depolarization or the resting membrane potential. And they prolong the effective refractory period, as we've already seen with some of the class one drugs that have class three activity. These class three drugs are going to prolong the QT interval, and therefore they're going to increase the risk of torsade and other ventricular arrhythmias. All class three drugs have some potential to induce arrhythmias. The first class three drug we'll talk about is amiodarone. Now amiodarone is structurally similar to thyroid hormone or thyroxine, and it's about 40% iodine by weight or by mass. Iodine is a very heavy atom compared to carbon and hydrogen and the other things in the molecule. 
So about, even though there are only two iodine atoms uh, in, in amiodarone, that's about 40% of the drug's mass. Amiodarone shows class 3 activity. It also shows class 1, class 2, and class 4 activity. So it blockades a lot of different ion channels. But the class 3 activity is the predominant effect. So that's why we call it a class 3 drug primarily. Amiodarone is used to treat refractory supraventricular arrhythmias as well as ventricular tachycardias. It's used to treat atrial fibrillation and VTAC and VFib. Despite the, the terrible side effect profile, which we'll talk about in just a moment, it is one of the most widely used antiarrhythmics on the market, uh, and its, its use is actually increasing. Um, the pharmacokinetics of amiodarone, it's an oral drug, but it can also be given IV. Uh, it has incomplete absorption, and it's one of the few drugs that's better absorbed when given with food. It has a prolonged half-life of several weeks, so it will stay in your body a long, long time after you stop it. It, it distributes extensively in adipose tissue, so it has a large volume of distribution, and that gives it a long half-life. The full clinical effects of amiodarone may not be achieved until you've been on the drug for some six weeks, so you have to use a loading dose. Usually when you're starting the drug, you give large doses, maybe 400 milligrams once a day, for several weeks and then you gradually back down to about 100 milligrams a day. The adverse effects of amiodarone are really, really important. More than 50% of patients who take amiodarone long term will develop side effects that are bad enough that they have to stop taking the drug. More than 50%, so this is very common stuff. You can give a lower dose of amiodarone, which will reduce toxicity and still maintain some clinical effect, uh, but a lot of patients will still have adverse effects from amiodarone. The first adverse effect is pulmonary toxicity. You can get interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, so you need to monitor pulmonary function tests, or PFTs, periodically. The most important pulmonary function test for amiodarone toxicity is the diffusion capacity, or DLCO. Amiodarone, as I mentioned, is very structurally similar to thyroid hormone. It has a lot of iodine, so it can cause thyroid toxicity. It can cause either hypothyroidism, where the thyroid gland is underactive, or hyperthyroidism, where you have too much thyroid hormone. So you need to monitor thyroid function tests, or TFTs. And then you can also get liver toxicity, so you need to monitor LFTs, or liver function tests. So patient on amiodarone, you want to monitor TFTs, PFTs, and LFTs. Amiodarone can cause nervous system problems. It can cause tremor, it can cause ataxia, or cere cerebellar problems, uh, balance problems. Uh, it can cause dizziness, it can cause peripheral neuropathy, GI intolerance, uh, notably constipation. It can cause deposits in the cornea of the eye. It can cause skin problems, it can cause photosensitivity or light sensitivity. And you can also cause a blue skin discoloration due to the iodine from the drug being deposited in the skin. Now there are three common drugs that cause photosensitivity. Uh, photodermatitis, the three drugs are sulfonamides or sulfa drugs, amiodarone, and tetracycline. So there's a quick mnemonic, ISAT for a photo. SAT, S-A-T, stands for sulfonamides, amiodarone, and tetracycline. Another class three drug that's not found in Lippincott that's relatively new, it was just approved in 2009, is called dronetarone. It's structurally very similar to amiodarone, but it doesn't have iodine in it, so you don't get a lot of the toxicity from amiodarone. Dronetarone is less lipophilic, so there's less neurotoxicity, so it's a better drug on a lot of fronts in terms of adverse effects. It's a class three drug. It blocks potassium channels. It's approved to treat atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, but it hasn't been pr proven to reduce deaths from these uh, arrhythmias. Generally, dronetarone is less effective than amiodarone, but it's also less toxic, so it may be worth the trade-off. In terms of adverse effects, like amiodarone, it can cause some GI intolerance. Rarely it can cause some photosensitivity, but because you don't have the iodine, you don't get the thyroid toxicity, uh, you don't get the blue skin discoloration. There's no reported pulmonary toxicity. There are very rare reports of severe liver injury, although overall this is much less frequent than we've seen with amiodarone. Dronetarone is contraindicated in patients with congestive heart failure or patients who have had a recent congestive heart failure exacerbation. So that's a black box warning. That's the strongest warning that the FDA can put on a drug without taking it off the market. So no dronetarone for patients with congestive heart failure. The next drug is sotalol. It's also a class three antiarrhythmic, so it's going to block the potassium channels. It's going to block the rapid outward potassium current, which is called the delayed rectifier current, and that's going to prolong repolarization. 
Sotalol, as you might guess from the name, also has potent beta blocker activity. Beta blockers such as Sotalol are used long term to reduce mortality associated with MI, and they're used to suppress ectopy and reduce myocardial oxygen demand. Sotalol has strong antifibrillatory effects, uh, particularly in ischemic myocardium. So Sotalol has a low rate of adverse effects. Uh, it has the lowest rate of adverse effects of all antiarrhythmic drugs, but it can prolong the QT interval and it can cause torsades in 3 to 4 percent of patients. Another class 3 agent is dofetilide. This is not widely used. It can only be prescribed by a physician who goes through specific training because of its potential proarrhythmic effects. It is sometimes used to treat atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. It's only used as an inpatient, so only in hospitalized patients. It is about 80 percent excreted by the kidneys unchanged and you have to adjust the dose in renal failure. And the adverse effects, it promotes a torsade to point like all uh, class 3 antiarrhythmics. Another class 3 antiarrhythmic drug not in Lippincott is Bertillium. It uh, has some potassium channel blocking properties. Bertillium is also known to block the release of norepinephrine, so it's a sympatholytic drug. Bertillium is sometimes used uh, as an IV drug in the emergency management of ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, but it has to be used with caution because it can cause some hypotension. It used to be part of the ACLS code uh, protocol for the treatment of VTAC and VFib, but that's no longer the case. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. Hey there, Sal! Yo. Come on, Sal! Perk up your pretty pink self! <laughs> what? Yeah, your personality is positively pathetic today! Oh, I get it. Okay, I'll bite. Hey, Hal, what's with all the peas? Ah, it's all about peas for today's mnemonic. Six peas, to be exact. The six peas or side effects of amiodarone. Prolonged action potential. Photosensitivity. Pigmentation of skin. Peripheral neuropathy. Pulmonary alveolitis and fibrosis. And... Problems with the thyroid. That's six P's. Nice one, you pathetic purple pinhead. Ah! What a pointlessly predictable production. All right, we're back for our quick review number two. Let's get started. What are some therapeutic uses for quinidine? Well, atrial, AV junctional, and ventricular tachyarrhythmias. They can maintain the sinus rhythm after direct current cardioversion of atrial flutter or fibrillation. And they're also used to prevent frequent ventricular tachycardia. Next question. One of the primary uses of procainamide is for Wolf-Parkinson-White or WPW syndrome. What are some char characteristics of WPW syndrome? Well, uh, it's a ventricular pre-excitation syndrome. So due to accessory conduction pathways from the atria to the ventricle, and we refer to this as the bundle of Kent, you kind of bypass that AV node, so you're kind of constantly re-exciting your heart. So the ventriculars begin to partially depolarize earlier, and this is when you'll see the delta waves on the EKG. And this may lead to supraventricular tachycardia. Next question. What type of arrhythmia is lidocaine used for? Well, this is used mostly for ventricular arrhythmias. Next. Class II drugs consist of beta blockers. What is the treatment for overdoses of beta blockers? We didn't talk about this uh, much at all in the lecture, but beta blockers, very commonly used. Uh, and if you get an overdose of beta blocker, what do you generally see? What are you going to see? Bradycardia, hypotension, uh, syncope, all those great things. Not uncommon to see this uh, in the outpatient setting because we use a lot of beta blockers for a lot of things. So what are you going to use? Well, the, the medication of choice is glucagon. Next question. What causes an increase in toxicity for all class one drugs? So remember this hyperkalemia. So that's going to increase your toxicity. Next question. Describe the pharmacokinetics of amiodarone. So amiodarone has a prolonged half-life of several weeks. So it takes a long time to get in and out of the system. 
distributes extensively in adipose tissue, uh, and the absorption is increased if given with food. So remember, amiodarone stays around forever, uh, distributes everywhere, and then uh, absorption is increased given with food. Next question. Uh, dronadarone is contraindicated in patients with what disease? So you don't want to use this medication in congestive heart failure, so remember that. Next question. Fill in the adverse effects for the drugs listed below. First, we have quinidine. You have uh, synchronism, arrhythmias, thrombocytopenia, and GI side effects. Next, procainamide, and you get reversible lupus-like syndrome. So lupus-like syndrome, very testable question right there. But you can also get arrhythmias, depression, hallucinations, and psychosis. Disopyramide, uh, remember anticholinergic effects, lidocaine, you can get drowsiness, slurred speech, paresthesias, confusion, agitation, and convulsions. Tokenide, pulmonary fibrosis. Fleckenide, dizziness, blurred vision, uh, induced ventricular tachycardia. Propranolol, hypotension, bradycardia, bronchospasms. Remember, this also affects your beta 2. Erectile dysfunction, hypoglycemia, and dyslipidemia. And amiodarone. Uh, this is also a very testable one that you'll see on test often. Interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, thyroid and liver toxicity, constipation, corneal deposits, photosensitivity, and blue skin discoloration. All right, so that's going to conclude this quick review. Let's get back to the lecture. So the last group of uh, drugs we'll talk about are the class 4 antiarrhythmic drugs. Remember, no bad boy keeps clean. C for clean stands for calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers decrease the inward current carried by calcium, and, th and that results in a decreased rate of phase four spontaneous depolarization in the pacemaker tissue, so this will slow the heart rate. Now, there are two types of calcium channels. There's voltage-gated calcium channels and receptor-operated calcium channels. Calcium channel blockers primarily act on the voltage-gated channels. They bind only to open, depolarized channels, so they prevent repolarization until the drug dissociates from the channel. These drugs show use dependence. They block effectively the heart tissue that is rapidly depolarizing, and they, uh, they don't have as much effect in a normally paced heart because the calcium channels in a normally paced heart have time to repolarize, and the bound drug dissociates from the channel before the next conduction pulse comes along. So in terms of antiarrhythmic uses, calcium channel blockers are primarily used for atrial arrhythmias. They're used to reduce the ventricular rate in atrial fibrillation. They're used for rate control, not to maintain normal sinus rhythm. And they can also be used to treat AVNRT, or that AV nodal reentry tachycardia. Calcium channel blockers can also be used to treat hypertension. They can be used to treat angina. They can be used to prevent migraines and other headache syndromes, such as cluster headaches. And they can be used to treat vasospastic disorders, such as Raynaud's phenomenon. These are primarily oral drugs, uh, although diltiazem is sometimes given in the hospital as an IV drug for acute atrial fibrillation to slow the heart rate down. Verapamil is extensively metabolized by the liver, and so you have to use caution in patients with liver disease. In terms of adverse effects, these drugs are negative inotropes. They will reduce myocardial contractility, and they are contraindicated in congestive heart failure because of that. They cause some hypotension, and the non-dihydropyridines, the ones we're talking about, will cause bradycardia. Calcium channel blockers can also cause edema, and rarely they can cause some gingival hyperplasia or hyperplasia of the gum tissue. Especially verapamil can do this. So let's talk briefly about a couple of other drugs which are sometimes used for arrhythmias, but they're not classified as class 1, 2, 3, or 4 drugs. The first drug I want to talk about is digoxin. It's discussed in detail in the lecture on heart failure drugs because it's primarily a positive inotrope used for heart failure. It inhibits sodium-potassium ATPase, which is responsible for reestablishing the normal electrolyte balance of the heart cells. And therefore, it is going to shorten the refractory period of the myocardial cells, and it will prolong the refractive period and diminish conduction velocity in the SA node and the AV node. In terms of therapeutic uses, it's sometimes used to control the ventricular response in patients with uh, rapid ventricular response from atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. This is a less common use than it used to be. It's much more common now to use a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker for this. And as I mentioned, it's also used to treat congestive heart failure. I'm talking about the pharmacokinetics of digoxin. It has a long half-life, about 36 hours, so it's going to stay in the, in the body for a long, long time. It has a large volume of distribution, 
So you have to use loading doses in the hospital to get the, uh, the plasma levels up to a therapeutic dose quickly. And digoxin is renally excreted, so you have to adjust the dose in patients with renal failure. As I already mentioned, there's a drug, an antiarrhythmic drug, that will reduce the renal uh, excretion of digoxin. Do you remember what that drug was? Quinidine. So if you have a patient who's on digoxin, you're switching over to quinidine, remember that digoxin has a long half-life, so it's going to stay in the body a long time. So even if you stop digoxin right away and switch them to quinidine, quinidine is going to slow the renal excretion of the digoxin that's already in the body. So you have an increased risk of digoxin toxicity during that time period. Digoxin has a relatively narrow therapeutic index, so it has uh, a lot of potential for adverse effects. There's a very small difference between the therapeutic dose and the toxic dose. It, most of its adverse effects are cardiac. It can cause slowing of the atrial ventricular conduction associated with atrial arrhythmias. Uh, it causes ventricular ectopy and may result in ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Hypokalemia or low potassium will definitely predispose to uh, digoxin arrhythmias. Digoxin is typically, even in non-toxic doses, is associated with uh, specific EKG changes which, which are worth knowing. It can cause narrowing of the P wave, prolongation of the PR interval, narrowing of the QRS complex, and narrowing of the QT interval. So unlike a lot of the drugs which prolong the QT interval, digoxin can actually narrow the QT interval. Digoxin can cause some extra cardiac side effects. It can cause GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, anorexia. It can also cause some vision disturbances. It can cause yellow or green discoloration of the vision, especially when you're looking at bright light. The other antiarrhythmic drug worth talking about that's not classified as class 1, 2, 3, or 4 is adenosine. Now, adenosine is a naturally occurring nucleoside, and it has two major actions on the cardiovascular system. We're going to talk about them separately and why we use adenosine in each situation separately. First of all, adenosine can cause transient heart block at the AV node. There's an adenosine receptor, and when you trigger that adenosine receptor, it increases potassium permeability, and so you're going to hyperpolarize the cell. You're going to make the resting membrane potential more negative than the negative 75 normal resting membrane potential. So basically, you're going to cause the heart to stop transiently. So how do we use this? Well, you can give IV adenosine to break supraventricular tachycardia. You can either cure it all together and, and break the SVT once and for all, or sometimes you can just cause the SVT to slow down enough that you can look at the heart rhythm monitor and look at the underlying rhythm and then decide what it is and treat appropriately. Usually you only use IV adenosine for this after you've done a maneuver called carotid body massage or carotid massage. So when you massage the carotid body, you're massaging the baroreceptors, the pressure receptors, you're sending a signal to the brain that the blood pressure is too high. The brain then sends a, a reflex signal via the vagus nerve to the heart to slow the heart rate down. So carotid massage will cause the heart to slow down. Before you do carotid massage, it's very, very important that you listen to the carotids with your stethoscope and make sure there's no carotid brewy. If there's a carotid brewy, it could indicate that you've got some plaque buildup there, and if you start to massage that plaque, theoretically you could cause the plaque to break loose, travel up to the brain, and cause a stroke. So carotid massage is important before you do IV adenosine, but before you do carotid massage, you auscultate the carotid arteries, listen for any carotid brewy. The other major use of adenosine uh, is related to the fact that adenosine can cause dilation of normal healthy arteries. Basically, if you have healthy endothelium, adenosine will cause the, the smooth muscle in that part of the artery to dilate, so you have increased perfusion. We use this in patients who need a nuclear cardiac stress test but who cannot tolerate exercise. For whatever reason, they've got bad knees or bad hips, or they just can't walk long enough uh, to tolerate the exercise on the treadmill. So we do an adenosine nuclear stress test. Adenosine is given. It causes dilation of the normal coronary arteries, so you have increased perfusion in the parts of the heart that are supplied by that normal healthy artery. In areas of the coronary arteries where you have a fixed obstruction, you have some coronary disease, or some atherosclerosis, you're not going to be able to dilate those portions of the artery, so the, the downstream myocardium will not show increased perfusion, and you can see that on the nuclear scan. The pharmacokinetics of adenosine, it is metabolized by enzymes, enzymes that are found in the vessel walls, so uh, it has an extremely short half-life, it is only in the, in the body for maybe 30 seconds, and then it's completely cleared from the plasma.
So any antiarrhythmic effect of adenosine is very short-lived. Uh, you can block the effects of adenosine uh, by giving theophylline. So if you have a patient who comes in with asthma or COPD and they happen to be on theophylline, they've got SVT, you can't give adenosine, it's not going to work because the, the theophylline is going to block that effect. Adenosine has relatively low toxicity because it's only in the body for a few seconds. But during those few seconds, patients feel really terrible while they're, while they're on it. It causes transient flushing. It causes chest pain. It causes hypotension. Patients say it's really uncomfortable. So if you've got a patient who comes in with SVT, you're gonna, you tried your carotid massage and that didn't work, you, um, you, you, you're going to give them IV adenosine. You want to warn them. You're going to say, this is going to feel terrible for just a few seconds. You're going to have chest pain. You're going to feel flushed. You're going to feel awful, but it'll go away in 15 or 20 seconds. If you warn patients of that, it'll generally be uh, well tolerated. The other thing you want to do before you give IV adenosine is turn down the sound on your cardiac monitor because if a patient hears the flat line, they're going to panic, and rightfully so. You know that it's only going to be a temporary flat line. A couple of other quick drugs to talk about, and I hesitate to call them drugs. One of them is magnesium. We know that hypomagnesemia or low magnesium can trigger some arrhythmias, so we can give IV magnesium to correct the uh, magnesium de depletion and correct the arrhythmia. This is especially true for torsades and digitalis-induced arrhythmias. We know also that IV magnesium can treat arrhythmias even if you have a normal magnesium level. We don't really know why, but we know that magnesium has some influence on the sodium-potassium ATPase enzyme. It also has some influence on sodium channels and potassium channels and calcium channels. So sometimes giving IV magnesium can be beneficial even if you have a normal magnesium level. And then finally, sometimes we give IV potassium as an antiarrhythmic. Hypokalemia is a cause of arrhythmias in a lot of situations. Ectopic pacemakers are much more likely to be active if you have hypokalemia. So we treat with IV potassium in order to correct this deficiency and therefore stabilize the membrane potential. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. All right, it's time for our third and final quick review. Let's get started. What is the mechanism of action for class four drugs? Well, primarily they affect the AV nodal cells. So you'll get decreased conduction of the velocity and you'll increase the ERP or the effective refractory period and the PR interval. Next, what are the therapeutic uses for calcium channel blockers? Well, there's a lot of uses for these. We use these quite commonly, uh, but you can reduce ventricular rate in atrial flutter and fibrillation. You have your AV nodal reentry tachycardia that you can use this for. Hypertension, very, very common use. Angina, you can prevent migraines. And then vasospastic disorders like Raynaud's syndrome. Next, how does quinidine interact with digoxin? Well, it decreases digoxin clearance and it displaces digoxin from uh, tissue binding sites. Next question, what is the treatment for digoxin toxicity? Uh, so we didn't talk about this but you, uh, you will certainly run into this uh, in your uh, clinic. So first, you want to slowly normalize potassium. Oftentimes, you will see hyperkalemia uh, in digoxin toxicity, but you have to be careful. Uh, if you have a chronic toxicity, hypokalemia can be a bigger problem. Next, uh, symptomatic bradycardia or bradyarrhythmias can be treated with atropine. Hypotension can be treated with IV boluses of isotonic crystalloid. And then here's a big one that for questions, anti digoxin FAB fragments. So you can use these uh, antibody, uh, digoxin antibody fragments, um, though you're not going to see this done very often. It's called digibind uh, in the real world, but it's really, really expensive. I've, ne I've never seen it been used before, but uh, be aware of that. That's good for testing. Lidocaine to treat uh, VTAC or VFib, uh, magnesium as well, and then cardiac pacer for uh, really bad situations. Next question. What is the drug of choice for treating acute supraventricular tachycardia? Well, the drug of choice is adenosine. Now, remember, what do we do before adenosine? Usually that carotid massage. Next question. A 67-year-old male presents to the ER with chest pain and shortness of breath. He has a history of COPD and coronary artery disease. You order an EKG, which shows SVT, or supraventricular tachycardia. 
After ruling out any carotid bruise, you start massaging the carotids, but uh, with no success. Then you administer adenosine to treat the SVT, but it does not work. What medication could be blocking the effects of adenosine? Well, remember we talked about this in the lecture. This is theophylline. So he's using the theophylline because he has COPD for his uh, chronic lung disease, and that could block that effect of the adenosine. All right, so that's going to conclude our quick review number three. Next is our end of session quiz. So I want you to stop the video. I want you to answer all the questions as best you can on the end of session quiz, and then restart the video, and we'll go, go over the answers together. All right, we're back, and it's time for our end of session quiz. Let's go over these answers. For each class one antiarrhythmic drug, list whether it is a class 1A, 1B, or 1C. So the first one, uh, disopyramide, uh, that's going to be a 1A. Flecainide, 1C. Lidocaine, 1B. Maxillotine is going to be a 1B. Procainamide, 1A. Propofenone is 1C, quinidine 1A, tokenide 1B. Next question. Match the following clinical descriptions with the most appropriate therapeutic agent. We've got our lists of medications you can use. First, 58-year-old woman has acute supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, that's easy, that's adenosine. 47-year-old male is having an MI and needs treatment of his ventricular arrhythmia. We can use lidocaine. A 53-year-old man has a refractory ventricular tachyarrhythmia. We can use amiodarone. 64-year-old woman with a history of lung disease and liver disease and needs rate control for her chronic AFib, and that will be diltiazem. Next question. Patients on drugs that prolong the QT interval are predisposed to which cardiac arrhythmia? So this is an easy one. This is torsades. Next, which antiarrhythmic drug can cause pulmonary fibro fibrosis, photosensitivity, corneal deposits, and CNS toxicity such as tremor, ataxia, and dizziness? And that's going to be amiodarone. Another good question about amiodarone, what tests must be routinely monitored in patients taking amiodarone? So remember, these are our Ts, or our PFTs, pulmonary function tests, LFTs, liver function tests, and TFTs, thyroid function tests. Next question. What antiarrhythmic drug can cause synchronism at toxic doses? So this is going to be quinidine. Good testable question there. Which antiarrhythmic drug can cause a reversible lupus-like syndrome? That's going to be procainamide. Which antiarrhythmic drug is structurally similar to amiodarone but is much safer and also less effective? And also, you can't use this on CHF. Remember, that's going to be dronetarone. Next question. What adverse effects should you warn patients about before giving IV adenosine? Uh, well, they're going to feel awful. <laughs> um, they're going to get transient flushing. They're going to get chest pain and hypotension. I've had many, many patients come back from their adenosine stress test saying, I will never do that again. I thought I was dying. So it is a big deal, so really warn them. Next question. What electrolyte abnormality increases the risk of digoxin toxicity? Um, so we talked about this real briefly before. Hypokalemia uh, is what you're, is the answer here. So if, if it's, especially if it's a chronic digoxin toxicity, so if it's not someone who's taking 1,400 pills, uh, but maybe chronically over weeks to months just taking too high of a dose, that hypokalemia can be a really, really big deal. So um, it's often used, uh, again, when people are taking digoxin and it's paired with, say, a non uh, potassium sparing uh, diuretic, um, so something like furosemide or thiazide direct, which are very, very commonly used. So you want to watch that, that potassium level uh, so your digoxin does not end up being a, a big problem for you. All right, so that's going to end our end of session quiz, and that's going to be the end of our lecture. I hope you learned a little something, and good luck studying.